Well, welcome back to these Constant Contact videos. Um, last week, we started to consider the question around what does the Bible say about sonship? And, and we acknowledged how sin has been handed down from Adam, from our first parents, but then we also can know that in Christ we can experience a new life. We also talked about the shame that we came that can come with that first sin that did come with that first sin and then equally that when we ourselves sin the shame that we also will experience and how we are continue to be affected by that shame and it really when we do that <clears throat> whatever wounds we have had in our past and whatever failures or maybe sins that have come up over and over again we have a tendency to never completely heal I am amazed at two things that I often see happen when someone is paralyzed by past experiences. First, I've studied some brain science and have learned a few things. That is, within the brain, there is what is called the amygdala, which processes emotions. And it is possible that different people have larger amygdalas than others, and that can then affect how emotional a person can be. If you combine strong emotions that are connected with traumatic memories, the amygdala can relive these memories easier because of the emotions associated with them. As you combine the size of the amygdala with the traumatic experience, it then makes it easier for a person to allow those very events in their past to run on repeat to the point of even creating a little literal physical ditch that is dug in the brain. Um, in terms of brain scans, they have been able to see these ditches, these, um, it, it looks like long craters in literally in the physical nature of the brain. And once that ditch is dug, it is easier for our brain to return to that memory we retrace it over and over again, and in doing so, we dig the ditch further and further and further down. So you can see the circular pattern, that as the ditch is dug and the memory is easier to access, the ditch is dug further, making the memory easier to ac access. Trauma then begins to literally define our very existence and our reality is defined by those difficult situations. I have spoken to people that have experienced something traumatic years upon years ago, much earlier in their life, but when they talk about that particular experience, it's as if the event happened yesterday. And when they tell that story as if the event has happened yesterday, it actualizes that trauma it actualizes that memory so that it's more accessible the next time that they do it and every single time afterwards the second portion of paralysis happens when we let that thought take us captive rather than to do what paul says to do in terms of we are called to take every thought captive to jesus christ so the trauma of our past or our sin or maybe our ancestry d begins to define us rather than Jesus. A few examples of this may be if you are told you are stupid or you are a failure over and over and over again, you let that voice and you let that narrative define you. Or if your father or mother had a certain narrative for their lives, then it is inevitable that you will both in inherit and actually live the same way that your mother and father was. So an example of this would be if your father was a drunk, his father was a drunk, so therefore I will be a drunk true. Or if there's a family history of heart attacks at a certain age, then naturally it is only to be expected that you will equally have that same experience at a similar age. Or it may be as simple as saying my father was a carpenter, so therefore I should take up that same trade. It would have been expected for Jesus to be a carpenter since his father was a carpenter. 
or maybe even something much more simple, that if you succumb to sin, you allow that sin to define you. Certainly there are extreme examples of addicts that uh, numb themselves with whatever it is that they're addicted to, and then they will continue to use that addiction to numb their very emotions so that eventually that's just who they are. They are, by definition, numb. They are ambivalent to or inambivalent to anything that is going on. Or if you're trying to take control of a certain ongoing sin in your life, but you are unable to control that certain sin, then the enemy can kick you while you're down. And we have a tendency that when we sin, that we will hear the voice saying, you will never overcome this. You are not worthy of being loved. Or why would Jesus die for you? Now, there are truths found in scripture given us to by Jesus himself through the power of the Holy Spirit that speak into these difficult situations in our lives. One, just because something happened in the past doesn't mean that that past has to repeat itself. In Galatians 4 verses 1 through 7, Paul puts it this way. Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their, fa they, their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were like slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us when we were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, to cry out this so personal cry, Daddy, Papa. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. In other words, as a child of God, you do not need to be defined by your past any longer. In Jesus, you can be set free that for freedom, he has set us free. But how many of us allow our past to define us on a regular basis, believing the lie that we will never be more than who we have ever been. Secondly, in our sin and captivity, we allow Satan to define our existence. And then in doing so, we allow him to question what God is really saying of us. And we have the ability to stay in our slavery, to be defined by our slavery. Such a reality, though, allows fear to define us. And so we are slaves. We're unable to move forward, and we are always held back. Now, I have come to find that the temptation is to hear Satan's voice and be at the very least hesitant to do the things and to be the things, to be the person that God has called us to be, that we then allow our past to keep us from experiencing what we might call God's preferred future, his plans for us. In Christ, and as God's very own children, he has amazing plans for us. Plans to prosper us in a future with hope, as Jeremiah told the exiles in Babylon at their worst possible moment. And as Paul says, what the world meant for harm, God meant for good. And Peter, Peter tells us that although you experience hardships, Christ has given us an inheritance that will not perish, that will not fade away. In other words, we have a tendency over and over again to fall back into being sons and daughters of Adam. And just as the serpent whispered deceit in the, the sons uh, uh, into Adam and Eve's ear, ears in the beginning at Eden, so also does Satan still try to whisper and to hold us captive to those very same lives today, those very same lies today. And yet, 
When Jesus went into the wilderness, he was attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit that he quoted scripture despite Satan's desire to bring Jesus harm. And Paul tells us to be prepared for battle. But because God has given us his full armor empowered by the Holy Spirit, we have a power and truth that can overcome the lie and overcome our sin. As John says, and the word was life and the light of the world that darkness cannot overcome. I am convinced that far too many people live ever being defined by who the world said that they are, who the world says that they will ever forever more shall be, and not by who God says they are. I am convinced that Christians' paralysis is based in our inability to truly hear Christ saying, your sins are forgiven, and today you are with me in paradise. I'm convinced that we are as Christians must step that we as Christians must step out of whatever darkness, whatever depression and whatever sin we might be living into to embrace God's new way of life, to be courageous by the power of the Holy Spirit to face the troubles that this world offers. This new way of life is where darkness is overcome, where God speaks hope in the midst of our depression, and that Christ takes our sin, making us white as snow. Yes, we are still sinners, but when we are reckoned as children of God, he no longer sees our sin. He no longer sees our past. Rather, he only sees Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. It is his blood that makes us white as snow. Finally, there is a perspective within psychology that will try to redefine our memories. And I am convinced that this is only truly and completely possible through Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit. I've often thought about how we could speak hope into the world by using that word alone. But in Christianity, we say hope has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. That is the biblical perspective that is able to say what the world meant to harm me, God meant for good, is written with an eternal spec perspective in mind. I mean, Paul spends most of his Christian life being persecuted, in prison, and he's in at least three different shipwrecks. At any point, he, have, he would have had every reason to give up Jesus and to consider it all rubbish, to consider it all loss. Or another way of understanding that passage is to consider all scuba. He could have considered it all just a load of crap, something that was not worth experiencing. But that's not what he does. Instead, he sees it at all of this as surpassing gain to know Christ and to make Christ known. So, lately I've been thinking a lot about the decisions I have made in my life. How there maybe have different, there's been different forks in the road, different pathways that I could have considered and wondered where my life would have taken me. Um, I also realized that many of my decisions are made based on where I perceive God calling me and where God is at work in my life and had God not spoken into those situations, I would have made very different decisions. I also realize <clears throat> that the decisions I have made because God is calling me a certain direction, they those decisions, those experiences have not come without their own degree of change, loss, or even trauma. And it is easier to wonder what could have been. It would be easier to say, you know, that's the narrow road, that's the difficult path. I'm not going to go down that way. It would be easier, especially in the midst of fear and doubt, to completely write off the Lord entirely, to follow my own voice, to follow my own conscience, and completely uh, disregard how God is acting in my life. It would be easy to listen to what the world says of me. It would be easy to 
that when I am discouraged and when I am down to give up entirely. And in those places where I don't have time to see, I need to glean perspective and I need to focus to know that the mind of Christ is available to us. And that in those situations, if we become one in mind with Jesus, that he might speak into our failures. In fact, it is in those dark times, it is in those struggles that gives me the greatest evidence for who God is. I often put it this way, that when my mind is so depressed, that when I am caught up in past mistakes, when I'm caught up in past experiences, doing those things I didn't want to do, but when I focus on God, I hear him speak something completely counterintuitive to whatever depression, whatever sin, whatever reality I'm facing that is not of the Lord. For instance, in my failures, when I'm able to seek the Lord out, I will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I'm like, why would you say that? I shouldn't feel that. That isn't true. But yet, it is. Because God says it's true of me. Or in my sin, I hear, I love you, I've always loved you, and I will forever love you. And in the secret, in the quiet place where I find his presence the most real in those times that I know that the Holy Spirit is just completely present and Christ is defining my reality. That is where I experience being a child of God and I experience peace that surpasses my understanding even in the midst of anxiety. And I've shared before having faced a panic attack. And in that panic attack, this was a couple of years ago, I, I realized that's what was happening, and I looked up, you know, what should I do about it? And I found the notion, you know, to focus on something, to focus on something that will draw you out of the panic. I said, well, I believe in Jesus, so why don't I focus on Jesus? And I began to focus on a picture that I love of Jesus and to look into his eyes, and I was captured. I was drawn, and I was taken out of my anxiety into his glorious presence. And I think it is in those places that, you know, even in my biggest doubt, there was one time that I was praying a prayer and I, th and I was so discouraged. And I said, Lord, what have you done for me lately? And I tell you the truth, I do not lie. The very next thing that I heard was the Holy Spirit speaking reality into my situation. He said, I remember this so clearly. I sent my son to die for you so that you might have life and life abundant. And I, I was just blown away that Jesus would speak into that situation. There was not a portion of me that would look to the, that would have thought of those scriptures. But yet Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, spoke so powerfully in my life. Most of all, in whatever ancestry I've been born into, whatever sin I cannot not do, and whatever failure I might try to that might try to define me, I hear one truth above and over any other lie, and that's in the tune of a song, which says, "I'm no longer a slave to fear; I am a child of God." I pray that this this t couple of videos have been meaning for you. I pray that you seek the mind of Christ and that he speaks truth into you to define who you are and to remind you just how loved you, you are. Because certainly Christ can't love you any less and he can't love you any more. And Christ's love is solidified in his life, death, and resurrection. May that just be... May that give us hope and peace and joy today. Uh, this week, we have Brigadoon going on. Um, if you haven't had tickets, uh, there's still tickets available, and you should definitely find a time to come join us. Um, we're just really looking forward to what God is going to do through Brigadoon. But also, if you have tickets, you may think of who is somebody that I could invite, who, might, who would be someone that could be blessed by this experience, and how can that relationship impact them for the glory of the Lord. 
And may we go in service this week. I uh, hope to see you all at some point this week. So I mean, we've got a lot going on. But until then, have a fantastic week. God bless. And love you guys. Hope to see you next time.